Begin 2023 with a library card. Get access to all our materials, including books, ebooks, e magazines, music, movies, and more. Apply in person at your nearest QPL location or apply for an e card online at queenslibrary.org. Martin Luther King Jr. Day is on January 16th. To honor this civil rights icon, we have special programs and recommended books and movies. Visit our blog at queenslibrary.org for more information. Join us for a new year of virtual author talks. Our Literary Thursday series brings you live conversations with amazing writers every Thursday at 6 p.m. Learn more at queenslib.org forward slash literary Thursdays. Celebrate Lunar New Year, the year of the rabbit, with our programs and book recommendations. You can learn more at queenslib.org forward slash LNY 2023. Welcome to Queen's Public Library's talk with Joyce Carol Oates, author of Babysitter, Them, Blonde, and many other novels, short story collections, and nonfiction books. Booklist exclaims, Babysitter eludes easy classification. It most resembles a psychological thriller, but with a dark, torturous, bloody undercurrents running through it. Oates risks losing squeamish readers here, but that's hardly a surprise from an author who has long embraced edgy subject matter. Also unsurprising is the quality of the writing, carefully constructed sentences, pitch perfect dialogue, and a central character who is simultaneously sympathetic and repellent. An outstanding novel from a true modern master who jumps across genres with unrivaled dexterity. The Observer states to be, to be able to write with such tearing astuteness about such fiercely contemporary issues, for it's impossible to read this novel without thinking of hashtag me too, and as the plot takes on an increasingly racist tone, hashtag Black Lives Matter too, would be, a, would be a feat for any author of any age. Joyce Carol Oates is astoundingly well into her ninth decade, and this perhaps even more astoundingly is her 59th novel. That she is willing, no, determined to go to the darkest, least politically acceptable edges of human emotion and behavior isn't so startling if you know her work. Kirkus writes, a searing work of slow burning domestic noir. Margaret Atwood says, unsettling, mysterious, deft, sinister, eerily plausible. Hi, I'm Brian Alessandro. I have written for Interview Magazine, Newsday, Penk, Huffington Post, Lambda Literary, and I've recently adapted Edmund White's A Boy's Own Story into a graphic novel for Top Shelf Productions, along with Michael Carroll and Igor Karash. Additionally, I co edited Fever Spores. The Queer Reclamation of William S. Burroughs, an anthology of essays and interviews about Burroughs for Rebel Satori Press. I'm also the co founder and editor in chief of the literary journal, The New Engagement. My first novel, The Unmentionable Mon, was published in 2015 by Karen Press, and my first feature film, Afghan Hound, was produced by Marier Media in 2011 and is currently streaming on Plex, Tubi, Amazon, and Apple. My new novel, Performer Non Grata, will be released in April by Rebel Satori Press. Culture, correction, Culture Connection, curated by Daniel Zaleski, and now in its 10th year at the Queen's Public Library, is proud to present international artists from emerging talent to award winning masters. These disciplines include music, theater, author talks, and film. Now expanding into a virtual format, Culture Connection is currently reaching a global audience. Joyce Carol Oates is a recipient of the National Humanities Medal, the National Book Circuit, Cir Critics Circle Ivan Sandroff Lifetime Achievement Award, the National Book Award, And the 2019 Jerusalem Prize for Lifetime Achievement, and has been nominated several times for the Pulitzer Prize. She has written some of the most enduring fiction of our time, including the national bestsellers We Were the Mulvaney's, Blonde, 
Firefox, which was adapted twice into films, one of which was Angelina Jolie's debut, and the New York Times bestseller, The Falls, which won the 2005 Prix Femina, as well as her landmark 1969 novel, Them, which won the National Book Award in 1970. In 2020, she was awarded the Sino del Duca World Prize for Literature. She is the Roger S. Berlin 52 Distinguished Professor of the Humanities Emerita at Princeton University and has been a member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters since 1978. Babysitter is her 59th novel. Joyce, thank you so, so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. So let's start, if you if you would. Um, I would like to start with a, with a synopsis of your novel issued by Kanaf, your publisher, just for those uh, viewers who haven't yet had the chance to read it. In the waning days of the turbulent 1970s, in the wake of unsolved child killings that have shocked Detroit, the lives of several residents are drawn together with tragic consequences. There is Hannah Jarrett, wife of a prominent local businessman who has begun an affair with a darkly charismatic stranger whose identity remains elusive, Mikey, a canny street hustler who finds himself on a chilling mission to rectify injustice, and the serial killer, known as Babysitter, an enigmatic and terrifying figure at the periphery of elite Detroit. As Babysitter continues his rampage of abductions and killings, these individuals intersect with one another in startling and unexpected ways. Joyce, can you tell us a little bit about your protagonist, Hannah Jarrett? Well, I should explain that initially the story of Hannah was um, a short story. It was quite mm -hmm. short. And it, it appeared in a, in L, I think it was Ellery McQueen magazine uh, some years ago. So I had always wanted to go back. I realized that it, it was not fully realized at all. So it was a much longer story, mm. very much bound up with my life when I lived in Detroit in, at the same time that Hannah, same time of the novel. Okay. So I had a, a kind of, haunted sensation about the story and wanted to revisit it. I, f I probably should describe myself as a formalist. I'm sort of an experimental writer. Mm -hmm. I like to take material and do something different with it. So I wanted to write a novel that was like a, a movie unfolding mm -hmm. so that the reader is like a viewer and we're watching this movie. We don't know what's coming ahead. When you write in the historic present, it's very different from writing that in the past. Sure. Because it's a story that says like once upon a time, if that's in the past, the story's over. So right. now we're recounting it. But this other kind of writing, which I find very challenging and exciting, it sort of takes you through a kind of consciousness like a river that's flowing and you're caught up in it as if you were the protagonist. So I, I certainly, go ahead. I, I certainly got that from reading it, Joyce. It's very visceral and immediate and urgent and, and cinematic, yes. Yes, well, unfortunately, I think that life is like that. And I always mm -hmm. feel that the next breath is something of, a, of an adventure, you know, waking in the morning, especially sure. maybe since the pandemic, we seem to live in perilous times there seems to be so much more death so much more immediate and evident than maybe you know when when i was growing up i think we were more shielded mm. from this sort of immediacy mm. and the novel was written during the pandemic right it was i would I could think of it as my pandemic novel and what a novel my god it's it's really harrowing so so valerie uh valerie so Hannah Jarrett and Mikey and Babysitter are your three protagonists, I think it's fair to say, even though the story focuses mainly on, on Hannah and her exploits. What, her, she's such a complex and fascinating character. If you had to sort of summarize her for our readers who haven't yet had, yet had a chance to get to the book, what would you say about her? Well, I don't know. It's hard to summarize a character when you're so deeply immersed. Like our own consciousness, we are immersed in our own being, but it's hard to say what we're like, you know. We have so many different attributes that come out in response to different audiences and different people whom we know. I mean, in, in one sense, I'm a very quiet, introverted person, but mm -hmm. in another sense, I'm a professor and I've given lectures and I, you know, I speak in public quite a bit. So it seems like the actual 
reverse of being a quiet, introverted person. But Hannah yeah, sure. is definitely a person of her time. She's a mm -hmm. woman of her era. She doesn't have a career. She married a man who can support her, and he doesn't. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't really want her to work. And she belongs to an upper middle class society in Detroit, Michigan in the 1970s, or rather in the suburbs north of Detroit, Bloomfield Hills and Birmingham and Gross Point mm -hmm. to the east. I lived, in, I lived in Detroit and I knew people who lived in these suburbs. So I was kind of tracing back my impressions and my, my memories. How about um, Babysitter? This character is based on the Oakland County child killer, is that correct? Yes, he was a real person. He was never, he was never identified. Hmm. Police think they know who it was. I mean, people wow. who are, people who are interested in serial killers all know who a babysitter is. Mm -hmm. And people have their own, um, probably their own theories about it. So I had my own theory about who babysitter was, but I wanted to do a little more with it. And I make him like the center of a web of intrigue and people who are enabling him. He, it's believed he was the son of a G, General Motors execut, wow. executive. So I just sort of, you know, speculating about that. I'm drawn to writing about mysteries that haven't been solved. Mm -hmm. I've done this several times and I'm always looking for some new sort of American archetypal emblematic symbolic mystery that hasn't really been solved. People may think they know who did it or what, who's responsible, but it hasn't actually, you know, been been uh, finalized. So I'm drawn to that. I think there's something about America that is so, so uh, mysterious and maybe based upon criminal behavior. And, and it really does have this sort of sociological quality to it, the novel. Um, it's, it's, yes, it's thrilling and it's, and it's frightening and it's disturbing, but it's, it's also incredibly rich and thoughtful and, and very knowledgeable about Americana and especially of that time. What kind of research did you do uh, into the 1970s, into Detroit and into serial killers? Well, a lot of it's just my memory. I, mm -hmm. I do remember seeing the, the, the newspaper headlines and seeing photographs of victims. And this went on for quite a while. Uh, babysitter had a reign of terror in parts of Detroit. People, people who were children at the time and grew up at the time, they all remember this because there was a lot of fear and everybody was quite frightened and school teachers were alerted to this possible danger. He seemed to just be an opportunist, that he was mm -hmm. a he was an abductor of small children because an opportunity opened to him. I don't think he was tar he wasn't targeting particular victims. So it's very hard for police to anticipate where he would strike next. Did did he get but his I, name I, babysitter? Yeah. Go ahead, Jason. Go ahead. No, I should say that what I brought to it in 2021, when I worked on it, was a sensibility that we have today about the enabling of, of pedophilia, the yeah. enabling by people who are not themselves pedophiles and are not criminals. But as with Harvey Weinstein, a whole mm -hmm. network of people, some of them probably nice, you know, quote, nice people, they were allowing Harvey Weinstein and other people like him, Jeffrey Epstein, to mm -hmm. victimize young young people, especially. It is, and so is. with Babysitter, when I first wrote the story, I didn't have that kind of consciousness. Babysitter was a kind of isolated person and a random person. So what I brought to the novel is something that's suffused in all of us today, that a serial killer and likely a, a sexual predator has gotten to be where he is because of people enabling him. To that point of looking at sort of these complex social situations and um, people who are complicit in them, 
uh, in these crimes. The novel also meditates on race and class and specifically on identity politics, weaponizing stereotypes, white privilege. What questions or concerns does it raise about those subjects? Because you really do dig in deep when you start writing about these, these concepts. Well, there had been the uh, civil unrest of July 1967, which is known popularly, like in, sensationally, as the Detroit riot. Mm -hmm. Black black people in a neighborhood, in an inner city, sort of rising up against policemen. So there was a lot of racial tension in, in Detroit. I think there always has been, mm -hmm. and maybe in large urban areas in which they're flaring up of. Uh, so-called riots in 1967, 1968, 1969, predominantly. And so that was just the way people felt. So if something was going on that was criminal behavior or pedoph pedophilia, uh, serial killing, I think the racists tend to blame one another. And mm -hmm. white people would think, oh, there's a black people doing this. And they're doing it on purpose, you know, they're taking white children. Mm -hmm. and we better get guns and be armed and it seems so exaggerated at the time and yet i guess things have gotten worse since then yeah. there are many more guns now than there were then yeah. unbelievably it's yeah so sad that nothing much seems to change it's tragic i think um your narrative voice and babysitter like with them and blonde is close intimate third person it's more internal i have to say than even the first voice narrative is by many other writers. What does writing in the close third person allow you to do that maybe writing in the first person does not? Oh, that's a good question. Well, when I'm when I'm writing something that's like a movie, I'm kind mm -hmm. of in the person's consciousness, but also outside. So right. I describe characters in a kind of moving uh, rippling way i mean yeah. not static they're like if hannah's going up an escalator or going down in an, in an elevator i'm kind of describing her but i'm also seeing the scene through her eyes mm -hmm. so i think in, in movie making when it's particularly effective we have the same sort of phenomenon where you're seeing somebody and yet you're sort of looking at at what they see as if you're in inside their consciousness it's amazing. It's go ahead. Go ahead. No, it's a strange kind of writing, and it's actually very stressful. I, mm. I actually don't know why I'm doing it. Just, <laughs> well, you do it really well, though. It's really <laughs> thrilling to read. <laughs> well, I teach creative writing, and I get very, right. very excited about my students and their voices and what they're doing. So I'm actually interested in many different ways of storytelling: first person, third person at a distance. Mm -hmm. you no know, collective mm -hmm. kind of collective consciousness this way of writing i wouldn't recommend for anybody i do <laughs> find it very stressful well i mean it's it's you're kind of exploring phenomenology here and and my background is in clinical psychology and i have to say that you do this thing so well all of your characters and babysitter are so different from one another and fall into different races and socioeconomic strata but you understand them all so well like a psychologist can you talk about your process or your approach to getting into, as I said before, the phenomenology of, of the characters? Well, I don't find people all that difficult to get into. I'm very sympathetic. Usually mm -hmm. when they're adolescents in my writing, I really identify with them a lot. Like mm -hmm. Mikey to me was very close to my heart. And I wrote a novel a few years ago called A Book of American Martyrs. As a young girl, she's about 15 years old, she becomes a woman, bo a boxer. And she was complete, almost completely, you know, non-verbal, and mm. not anyone who ever read a book. But I just feel very close to them, so I don't have any trouble with that. With me, it's trying to get the sentences to have this kind of mercurial, quicksilver mm. movement. If I'm trying to replicate a movie, where nothing ever stops, maybe it can mm -hmm. be slow motion, but it's sort of always going forward. The movie comes to an end. So Hannah thinks now and then she finds herself in nightmare situations and she thinks, oh, yeah. I got to play out the scene. And maybe it's because I'm a widow and I have had some, I guess, stressful periods in my life. I sort of feel that a lot of our lives are playing out the scene. 
Mm. It's pretty awful, mm. but if you hang on, maybe mm. by the tips of your fingers, you can get through the scene. <laughs> well, I, that's, I think that's really profound and uh, as a student, I think I, I agree with it. As, aside from the Oakland County child killer, were there any other true life stories that inspired any part of Babysitter? I mean, well, your experiences in Detroit in the 70s. But. Uh, that's a good question, because I wrote a novel called Zombie, also set in the Detroit area, set in right. Michigan. Right. And that was pretty much based on Jeffrey Dahmer and Ted yeah. Bundy, yeah. and maybe a couple of others. I had done some research, quite a bit of research, into the uh, psychology of, of serial killers, the obsessiveness, the fantastic the fantasy being in, in the throes and under the influence of fantasizing. Mm. These are people I think who can't help themselves, mm. by which I'm not absolving them because I'm, right. no, no. I mean, they, they can help themselves in a sense of just not acting on the fantasies. I don't think they can control the fantasies. No, so right. the fantasy is like a loop of video that's always playing in their heads and they can't somehow get free of it. So there are people like, say, Martin Scorsese and, and others, uh, David Cronenberg, who are filmmakers. Mm -hmm. They go to movies to put these fantasies in yeah. um, an objective form. Yes. And so the fantasies, uh, you can see recurring scenes and themes in Scorsese and certainly in Cronenberg and, oh, yeah. and the Coen brothers, you know. Yeah. We'll set up back, uh, maybe Stanley Kubrick. You kind of back there to a kind of archetypal seed scene that this person's working on. And Hitchcock, he's the best example. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. He's the very best example. He's totally, in, totally enthralled to his very sadistic fantasies working out in his head, involving women, especially blonde women, being threatened, harassed, or even killed. Mm -hmm. I think he was totally enthralled to that. He could do other things too, and he became quite a master of storytelling. So I feel in writing this way, you're sort of like a movie director, and you're also the actor in it. And I, I hope that when I'm done with this phase of my life that I won't write this way anymore. I do find it very stressful. <laughs> Well, to this to this point of fantasies and of sublimating fantasies and exploring fantasies, your character and babysitter Hannah has this kind of compulsion and sort of fetish um, that that and I don't want to ruin it for anybody who hasn't read it yet, but that kind of could endanger her. But she's yet drawn back to it over and over again with this man that she's having this affair with, who could be dangerous. Well, it's in contrast to her other life, which is like a a, a very confined and defined life. She has a calendar. Yes. It is all yeah. very uh, much, everything's allocated, you know. Yeah, but then yeah. she goes off the calendar. Like she never puts babysitter, I mean, she never puts YK, her lover. YK, she right. never marks that, you know. So then she gets in her car and she's almost thinking, well, fate will take me somewhere. Like my instinct, am I going to turn right and go shopping or am I going to turn left and go into the inner city of Detroit? So mm. I think as writers and artists, we make that decision. Should I do something domestic and simple and familiar that I've done before that people might like, or should I take a left turn and go into this other dimension? I might be really, really unhappy. People will be angry at me. They won't like it. I don't know why we do these things. And if there are people listening to this, maybe you, maybe you can, maybe you can explain it. <laughs> um, there's a scene in Babysitter where had this discovers that her daughter Katya is very ill in the morning, the morning after one of the rendezvous, rendezvous with her lover uh, YK and blames herself for her child's illness due to her absence. And then soon there is a meditation on babysitters victims, young children 11 to 13 years old. There's also a rumination on parenthood. I was wondering what your thoughts were on how often and how easily and how in so many ways adults fail children. Well, the, the odd thing is that though, though Hannah has not always been a great mother, she's been a very guilty and an obsessive mother. So when, it, when a sort of climax or crucial scene is coming, she completely opts to save her son. Hmm. She, she thwarts her lover who seems to have had designs on her son. She hmm. makes that decision 
I think completely impulsively and spontaneously. So before yeah. that, she had deluded fantasies of running away with him, maybe taking her children. And she half knows that those are crazy fantasies. But I'm really wondering, having lived my life, whether many people are just kept going by delusions, all kinds of sort of silly daydreams that they sort of half know are not even real. But when it comes right down to it, they don't really believe in them and they will opt to help somebody else or to save themselves. It's one of my favorite themes, actually, Choice, um, is that idea of self-delusion uh, and how we use it to sometimes get through the day. And to that point, and also this idea of the fantasies ruling us, there's also, though, a sense in your work of disconnection and loneliness in many of the characters, especially Hannah, who maybe seek fulfillment to, or maybe to fill a void. Um, maybe that desperation and isolation is what compels them to do strange or dangerous things to feel satisfied. Is that fair? Is that accurate? Uh, yeah, well, YK is like a, a sh shape shifter. He mm. tries to present himself in a way that really is very attractive to her. He flat Sometimes he flatters her, mm -hmm. and sometimes he berates her and humiliates mm. her because she feels very guilty, and she wants to be punished. I guess I know a lot of people who seem to want to be punished. They don't feel comfortable if they're not in some way punishing themselves. And of course, people do commit suicide. So yes. Hannah's always taking a chance when she turns left and drives down into Detroit. She's always taking a chance that that man is actually going to strangle her. Oh, she's yeah. up half six. And you don't even know whether she's already dead. And she's just in, a, in like the Bardo state. You know, she's, she's sort of not alive, but not completely dead, thinking over yes. what led her to this. I thought that a few times as I was reading it. Um, is she a masochist? Is it fair to say that? Well, many people, I think, are partly masochistic, and many women mm -hmm. are, and writers are, are very masochistic. Yeah. Yes. If yes. there are any writers listening, we're all laughing. Because, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Why, would anybody, why would anybody be an artist? It's like, yeah. it's like a boxer, a professional boxer. Oh, God, you yeah. have to expect yeah. to get hurt. If you're a great champion, you're still going to get hurt, and you're going to hurt really hard. So yeah. anyone who goes into certain activities, you may be successful, you may make millions of dollars, but you are going to be hurt physically yeah. and psychologically. Yeah. So Hannah does feel that she deserves to be punished. There are women, and maybe there are men too, who if they're treated too well by somebody, they, don't, they feel uneasy. They think, well... Mm. He doesn't really know me. Like if he knew who I was, he wouldn't be so nice to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's very insightful. I am. Um, I was talking to a friend of yours. I interviewed her last month. A. M. Holmes, the great writer. Oh yes. He's and great. she told me she said you have to ask Joyce about horror. She's a great fan of horror. I know that you're a fan of horror and a purveyor of horror in myriad forms and thematic forms and. I personally love horror because I think it focuses all of our general anxieties that we have about annihilation and it provides a catharsis. But why do you love horror and all of its permutations so much? Well, that's an interesting, um, that's an interesting idea. Yes. I, I mean, I'm interested in the art of the grotesque mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. that it's something that's like a finite and has a frame around it. I think horror in real life is completely chaotic. You know, we're kind of in a horrible situation politically in our country. I mean, during the pandemic, uh, public health crisis, completely out of control for many people and still, you know, still raging in a way. And so that's like chaos. To me, that's like real raw horror. But yeah. with a work of art, you, you select your cast of characters. You have a very simple, usually kind of simple plot and trajectory. Maybe at the end, there's a temporary triumph of some kind. Stephen mm -hmm. King usually does that. You have a trajectory where there's some sort of resolution that's not completely dark. H.P. Mm. Uh, Lovecraft is much darker. Oh, so, yeah. he, so, he, so he starts out at one level and just keeps going. <laughs> going, going deeper, darker. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's a narrative. So it's like storytelling. And it's, I find it fascinating. Like tragedy is a, mm -hmm. like a sacramental 
incantatory mm -hmm. art that has its tropes and its conventions. But all these are 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 selected and finite, unlike mm -hmm. light. Yeah. Yeah, it, I think it, uh, it's kind of, kind of therapeutic, maybe sometimes for writers or artists to explore this kind of, uh, uh, you know, very ambiguous, intimidating situation. One of the many things that surprised and impressed me about Babysitter Joyce was how some of the characters like Mikey or YK, who at first appear to be archetypal menaces, slowly reveal themselves to be tender and your treatment of them is quite humane, even if there, um, you know, remains menacing things about them. Can you talk to us about how you're able to do that and develop these characters that are kind of uh, repulsive or, or, or cruel or scary? Well, I really much identified with Mikey. I mean, not that yeah. I'm anything like him, but he's sort of <laughs> a street person who's like a hustler. He was an orphan. He was sexually exploited by older men. And then he is kind of aged out. He becomes eight, he's 18 years old and has to leave the uh, facility when he's in like a, a kind of orphanage or for boys. Mm -hmm. So he ages out and he goes into this sort of street world where he finds himself in an employee of a, of a really of a psychopath or a sociopath who's just you know using him. Oh, yeah. And then he kind of discovers in himself a sort of conscience mm -hmm. and he realizes that who baby he knows who babysitter is and he he knows how awful babysitter is he knows that nobody's going to stop babysitter unless it's him yeah so he kind of uh you know it's it's like vi a vigilante uh rising up of some natural person and i feel that in many people maybe in many adolescents they're not completely formed and they do have a con a conscience. Mm -hmm. And if they get in the right situation, they may just react in a way that's very uh, life sustaining, that they actually reach out and help somebody. Like the happiest he feels that he saves a child's life. Right. And he realizes how happy it makes him feel. He just like he's elated. He mm -hmm. did he did a good deed. And he didn't know he was going to do it. And then he does not an, another good deed, you know. At the same time, I don't want to make him into anything like a, a good Samaritan or a saint. No, you don't. And that's what's so great is it feels organic and, and honest. Um, so one of my favorite books ever is Them, which is your book, which won the National Book Award, of course, in 1970. Um, it, too, takes place uh, in Michigan, right, and is also about racial unrest. So what was it like for you to return to Michigan and to return to these uh, this theme of, of racial tension um, f almost f almost 50 years later? Oh, well, well I've, I've written about Detroit quite a bit over the, over the decades, actually. Mm -hmm. It's a place that I still know very well viscerally. I can shut my eyes. And driving with Hannah along the John Lodge Expressway, and she goes into the inner city and the tunnel of Windsor. My husband, Ray Smith, and I lived in Windsor for 10 years. So mm. to me, I just have to shut my eyes and I'm back. I'm usually in motion in a car. <laughs> and so for me, that's like going home. Maybe mm. it's a kind of homesickness and mm. going back to another era. I get a lot of happiness out of evoking a, a landscape or a cityscape. Mm. I love to sort of show, close my eyes and see something very vividly and then try to transpose it into words and so the reader can you know be traveling along the same way well it's it's great um you do it so well and it feels it feels very uh knowing you know you i knew that you must have spent a lot of time there i i didn't find it in your bio but i knew that you must have because you capture the place so well another book that i really adore is blonde of course which was just made into a film this past year by andrew dominic what did you think of his adaptation of your book of your novel. We should make that clear. Blonde is a novel. <laughs> it's a kind of, it's difficult to answer because Andrew Dominic, like like almost all the directors of stature, mm -hmm. is very mm -hmm. idiosyncratic. He has his own vision. He has his own way of doing things. So naturally, if I were to adapt my own novel, it wouldn't be what he did. He's, right. he's very uh, intransigent. 
I think he had a vision of Norma Jean Baker, who becomes Marilyn Monroe, almost as a gesture of desperation to save her, to save herself, you know? Yeah, yeah. She's uh, a victim. She, he saw her as traumatized. He saw Marilyn Monroe as a traumatized person. And I think to some degree that's, ap that's absolutely true. Um, I think that some people expected more agency that Marilyn Monroe at some points in her life was not only a victim. She was, she had a little more uh, inner resilience. Sure. And so I think people were upset that they didn't see the Marilyn Monroe that they're accustomed to seeing like in general prefer blondes. There are lots of, of footage of Marilyn dancing and singing and she's very, very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And she seems so assured and sweet, just sweet and lovely. People sort of feel that they know her. Mm -hmm. And so when they saw a real, like a real person who was Norma Jean Baker, who couldn't do that role all the time and was sort of beaten down and much victimized by, by men, Sure. People just felt betrayed and they didn't want to see it, including people who who are, you know, like good movies. They just felt it was it was such a visceral performance by Anya de Armas. Mm. It wasn't as if you were seeing a movie. It was sort of like this is this real, this is really the way Marilyn Monroe was suffering. Yeah, it's, so it's, it's harrowing. Um, yeah. yeah. And because Anna Dominic, of course, is a man. I don't think people felt that maybe he had the uh, the right to explore this kind of female suffering. Mm -hmm. Maybe a woman or a feminist filmmaker might have done it, you know, and, and it would have been the same movie perhaps, but it would have been viewed differently. And I'm not quarreling with that. I think it's a complex issue that people have about appropriation. And it's just the... Um, risks that a, a filmmaker makes if he's going to do something different. I I think, you know, well, first of all, I'm thrilled that uh, Anna, Anna de Armas got nominated for the Academy Award this week for Best Actress for the role. Yes. I think that will bring a lot of people back to the film. And I, I said, you know, to you earlier before we went on that I think that in 10 or 20 years, people will revisit it with some distance and perspective and come to appreciate it more than they are right now. Um, you know, I spoke with Jay Perini. Uh, the great writer Jay Perini last spring. Um, you know, he wrote about Borges, he wrote about Tolstoy, but fictional yes. accounts of these characters, of these real people. And we discussed the freedoms of writing fiction, fictional stories about real people rather than biographies, which is kind of what you did with Blonde. Can you talk a little bit about that, about that idea? Well, it's sort of an old, it's an old uh, trope or convention. You know, Shakespeare was writing about kings and and he was using some real historical, um, you know, Hallishan's chronicles. He was using real history as far as it was history back then. And then right. he was making everything up. And he was making all the language up. You know, like right. if there was a, a prototype for King Lear, we know that man, we know that Lear, L-E-I-R, we know that Lear wasn't speaking the language that Shakespeare made up for him. He was probably grunting and saying, you know, very very primitive things. Mm. So there's always been that tradition. I think there have been more novels written about Abraham Lincoln than anybody and lots of novels about Hitler. And so Marilyn Monroe is a public figure. And I think some people have, have written about her. I probably have written about her the mo in the most detail, like a thousand, right. fourteen hundred. It was 1,400 pages in manuscript, so I probably yeah. lavished the most uh, attentiveness to or obsession to Marilyn Monroe than anyone has ever done. Yeah, yeah. and it, it feels definitive, honestly, when you read it. It feels extremely intimate and, and definitive. Um, it also, your book also has this kind of iconoclastic quality that really excited me as I was reading it. And I don't just mean sort of, looking at sports or politics through DiMaggio or Kennedy or, or theater through Miller or even Chaplin. But you also kind of recreate and deconstruct various iconic moments in film history, pop culture. Uh, it, felt like you, it felt like it was the idea of idolatry and iconography themselves that you were dissecting and maybe even smashing 
Is, is that fair? Yes. Is that on your mind? Yeah. yeah, and I notice in the film, and Andrew Dominic definitely does this. We see yeah. Norma Jean Baker. She's just this. She is beautiful, but she's she she really lacks she lacks assurance, you know. And um, Elio Kazan said about her that she was the most uncertain, hesitant person he'd ever met. Wow! Until she became Marilyn Monroe in a role, you know, give her right. a script, and then she's got this other completely had a radiant luminosity. She's she's reciting a script. And as long as she has that script, she's brilliant. But then when she's thrown back on her in, in her own identity, she doesn't have a script. You know, mm -hmm. and most most of us don't, or we don't have any script. We're kind of blundering forward. We really don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Right. And so right. an actor who has a script can just do the most astonishing, astonishing kind of performances because they know where they're going. Hmm. Do you do a lot of pre-writing about characters before you start a book? Well, I do a lot of thinking. I do a lot. I like to run and walk. I do a lot mm -hmm. of running, sometimes even in, just in the house if it's cold out. But ideally, I would always go running every afternoon around 4 o'clock. And I would think and um, see the movie in my head of whatever I'm writing. I mean, I still do that. Sure. I uh, find that really the only way to write. I don't write just in words. First, I see what happens. You know, I'm seeing the people like they're actors. I'm seeing a scene. Mm -hmm. And how do you get the most out of a scene? So I identify with Shakespeare with that. Shakespeare always gets the most out of a scene. Like mm. he doesn't rush it he, and he, try, he doesn't want to do it too slowly. There's a certain pacing. Now, if you do a scene too quickly, you've kind of lost it. You know, so, sure. I'm, so I could say I'm kind of obsessed with the pacing of a narrative. And if I get it right, I keep doing, I keep revising. I revise all the time. And I'm sort of obsessive about revising. I know people don't think that. I guess people think that I write quickly. I could never in a million years write a novel like Babysitter as a first draft. I mean, I don't, I could never do that. It's do you like have an average? You know, like 17 times I'm doing a paragraph or yeah, 20 okay. times and I do it all over again. So it's it's very obsessive. And that, well, I guess it's a little bit, mas it may be masochistic to a degree. <laughs> well, it's very comforting to know that that you revise a lot because I'm, I'm a big fan of, of multiple revisions. And yeah. to the point, you know, you, you brought it up, but I have to ask, I know everybody asks you about it, but your productivity is remarkable. And I know for me, when I'm not working on a creative project, I feel unmoored and anxious. Is that something you wrestle with as well? Well, I'm always working on something. Mm -hmm. So I'm never really in that kind of limbo. I can get, uh, I can be frustrated and and restless if it's not going right or if it's going too slowly. Because mm -hmm. I'm I'm writing a, a suspense mystery novel now. It's uh, it's a little bit like Babysitter in that it's in present tense. Mm -hmm. So I've done the same thing, over, the same scene over so many times that I'm on page 160. But this all day to day, I went back to about page thirty. So here I'm doing a scene. I thought I thought I'd done it, but now I'm making it better. And I'm really mm -hmm. surprised that at some of the choices that I made the first time, because this time I just know it's much better. So there's always that feeling you can always make it better. So I when don't do have you? Go ahead. I'm sorry, Joyce. When do you know? When do you know it's done? There's a time when you finally know, but at the same time, I'm all, I'm a little cynical because I actually will discover I can always do a paragraph over again and it's better. Mm. And last night I had dinner with a friend, Jonathan Santloff, and I was talking a little bit about my novel I'm working on. And Jonathan said, yes, but don't forget turkey vultures. I'm going to be circling over a corpse. Uh. I, thought, I said, oh, Jonathan, I knew that. Well, I live in New Jersey. I totally mm -hmm. forgot that. And so today I went back and did all this revision, adding turkey vultures. Of course they would be there. They would That's be at the great. scene of this, of this murder. 
There's always yeah. a detail or something that you can add, yeah. right? Yeah. But it just yeah. happened that, I mean, I should have known it. I mean, mm. I, I don't want to go into too many details. It's kind of a grisly scene, but it, again, it's like a movie. Sure. What is your writing schedule? Is it is it fixed or does it change for each project? Well, I try to work early in the morning. I uh, often write when I'm still in bed, even like maybe like Edith Wharton, though she was writing in longhand and throwing the pages down on the floor for her maid to pick up. But I'm <laughs> writing on, on a laptop, and then I get up a little later, like maybe I maybe I start working at six a.m. That I finally get up when it's when it's light out. I don't really I don't like to get up in the dark. Hmm. So I guess that's a little bit of a superstition. If I wake up like at five o'clock in the morning, I don't want to get up until it's light. And then my my cats are sleeping with me, so I don't want to disturb them. But then I will get up, you know, when it's light, and then I go around do things in the house, and then I go to my study, where I'm working a little more. Um, at a different speed, I think. And I can work kind of all day long with interruptions. As I said, mm -hmm. I like to walk and run. I see people. Sometimes I'm teaching. And right. then I come back to what I'm doing. So at the back of my mind is always this kind of fascinating uh, movie going on. And I go back. It's like it's stilled. And I go back and start it again. The fantasies are always playing out. <laughs> um, we're going to be taking questions for Joyce in a few minutes, so please start sending them in. I have about a question or two of my own to ask you before we start taking questions from our viewers. You have a very well-known and very active Twitter account, Joyce, and you've made some headlines uh, with some of your tweets. Most recently this past summer, you wrote something about um, white cisgender male writers. You recently um, wrote a piece about Steven Spielberg's The Fablemans, which got a lot of attention. I think that maybe the backlash you sometimes received is often unfair and ill-informed. What are your th thoughts generally about this new world of social media, cancel culture, freedom of speech? Well, speaking about my own tweets, I'm always surprised that anybody takes them seriously or <laughs> thinks they're important. I can't even imagine why anyone would care what I thought about the fable ones. But I, I think of Twitter for me as sort of like conversation, like I might be talking to friends, Say I'm, I used to talk to Edmund White on the telephone a lot, but we sort of draw, you know, drifted away from telephone calls. But it's like you're having conversation with people. Some of them you know. I mm -hmm. have Twitter friends. And sometimes a lot of my tweets are in response to somebody else's tweets. So mm -hmm. when they're taken out of context, then they have a different meaning, which is not, you know, not the real meaning. Sure. But then um, Twitter more generally, I think, is a, is a wonderful source of what I would call a grassroots reportage, like people who are on the ground with their cell phones videotaping police misconduct and brutality, and keep and you know storms and floods and seeing people's houses and and seeing animals, you know, and that that kind of immediacy. It's there's never been anything like it in history. We use it. We usually have mainstream media. Mm. or television uh, news, and it's very narrow, and they select just a few topics. But as for my own Twitter, I just consider it like conversation. I'm always surprised when anybody gets upset about it, because <laughs> to me, if you're talking in a room with people, usually people respect one another's opinions and say, you might say, well, I don't agree with you, but here's my opinion, right. whereas they somehow go kind of crazy on Twitter so I, I don't understand that. But also, I don't really look at it. I keep moving on. It's like Heraclitus in the river. Each day on Twitter is completely <laughs> that's, probably, that's probably wise. Um, I have one final question, then I'll start asking, uh, sharing with you the questions that have come in from our viewers. Almost every fall, your name comes up as a likely finalist or winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature. It comes up every year I read about it. Does that kind of buzz or anticipation distract you at all? And how do you handle it? Oh, I don't think that's ever going to happen at all. It's it's sort of like the Twitter. It seems very unreal. Mm -hmm. And also, I have to say, you know, a great prize would mean so much if you had your family. But at this point in my life, I don't, I don't really have anybody who would care that much. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, to be frank about it. 
But, you know, when you're younger, any prize that you get, your mother and father are so happy. Mm. Or if you're married, I have a, a close companion, that there's a kind of happiness that you can share with somebody. But then if you're alone, it's it would almost be ironic. I remember mm. my first husband, Ray Smith, died very sort of suddenly. I was nominated for two prizes, literary awards. And I just thought it's so sad that they just don't nominate somebody else because it's lost on me. You know, mm. it's like giving a very nice meal to somebody who has no taste or mm. sense wow. of smell. So that's kind of the, the answer. Well, thank you for that choice. So a first question from our viewers. Uh, Gare of the 1000 Books, has Joyce started work on her Adora Welty novel yet? And hi and love from Gare. <laughs> oh, hi, Gare. I have to say I got sidetracked and I'm doing another mystery suspense novel. The whole phenomenon of writing about Eudora Welty is so exciting to me. And I've been to her house twice in Jackson. Mm. Uh, Jacksonville, and I was so haunted by I have all these notes. I have like 200 pages of notes, wow. but I don't know when I'm going to actually do it. So I feel a little guilty. <laughs> it certainly would be incredible, maybe I'm sure. I will, maybe I will the notes to somebody and they can write it. <laughs> Gosh. Um, hi from Chicago. If Joyce has time, could she talk a bit about what Jung means to her? She's used the term archetype tonight. I wonder how that idea affects how Joyce sees reality and fiction. Well, Jung is a very vast um, subject, and, and I think he had some ideas that that seemed valid and and fruitful and kind of creative. Other ideas he probably had that are, that are more embedded in his time and place, you know, more of sexism or even racism. I don't know for sure. I don't know what to say about that. So he's probably one of these figures that the more you look into him, the more the less you agree with him. But mm. taking the idea of the archetypal, like what we call the collective unconscious, mm -hmm. that's always been a very controversial term. But I think we can say, based on the behavior of human beings over, over the millennia, that our brains seem to be hardwired for us to believe in something like a god or a deity like the old wise man is how Jung spoke of that archetype of the, the God, the, mm -hmm. old, the old wise man. People will fall for that. Mm -hmm. sometimes, it's a con, sometimes he's just a con man and he's playing on the archetype. Other times the person could be genuinely a leader, a charismatic and care about other people. I mean, mm -hmm. I would guess that Jesus Christ as a historical figure was a wise person who had this kind of connection with others. And the collective unconscious is a kind of metaphor to speak of consciousness, even though it's probably not valid. Mm -hmm. But I do think we have these, um, some things we inherit, the way we, we do inherit a fear of strangers. Mm -hmm. It's hardwired that our brains react, uh, babies and infants, children, they react in a, a visceral neuron. way, yeah. if yeah. they see a face that's grotesque, mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. they see a human being that has something wrong with him or her, we can't really control that. So mm -hmm. that's Just what we might mean by an archetype. Uh, if you're in neuroscience, you you know can explore that in more more uh, scientific terms. Uh, another question is, uh, thank you for this brilliant interview, Ms. Oates. I recently went to a screening of Smooth Talk by Joyce Chopra and learned that the film was based on your work. Can you comment on this uh, and your work as it relates to this film? Well, a long time ago, I wrote a story called Where Are You Going, Where Have You Been? And it was anthologized quite a bit and ultimately became the story of mine that's the most read by anybody. Mm. And Joyce Chopra and Tom Cole to whom she was married at that at that time, he has passed away since then. They were f young filmmakers and they wanted to adapt it to a movie. So of course I said, yes, I wasn't involved otherwise. And I only saw it when it, when it was, um, it was given a preview and I was just dazzled to hear my own words in, in the <laughs> screen and, and it was quite, 
a remarkable experience. I mean, really, really quite stunning. I had no idea that it would be so remarkable because over the years, it was Laura Dern's um, premiere, her debut. So mm -hmm. Laura Dern was about 16 or 17. She's just wonderful. I mean, the movie might never have gotten anywhere without Laura Dern. Wow. She's terrific. We, I've seen We her love, just, yeah, I'm a big fan of Laura Dern's as well. She's yeah. fantastic. The two of us have kind of been parallel with each other, you know, over the decades, and she's right out there. She's still terrific. My yes, goodness. She's doing some of her best work now. She um, is. She's just amazing. So the, they changed the ending. Well, they made it longer. Smooth Talk is not the title that I had. So they took my story and made it longer. It's a feature film. Added a lot of scenes and not in the story and put in more relationship with the mother. And they did a wonderful job, and it's really quite remarkable. But there's a happy ending that's not my ending. And my <laughs> ending is of course, my ending is more like blonde. Yeah, you know? which uh, which I love so much. It's such a, I love those kinds of endings. Um, we have two great comments. Amazingly wonderful interview. Great questions. Great answers. Thank you for being a part of Culture Connection, Joyce Carlos. You are a national treasure. Um, and then another question. Joyce, can you tell us something about what inspired the leap between your novel Blonde and your most recent recent short story, Miss Golden Dreams, 1949, and your new book, Night Neon? Oh, gosh, that's a good question, too. Well, I was I was taking the I, I said that before I had 1,400 pages of Blonde. There have been parts of it that I had to cut out. It's only, only 800 pages. Only, was, <laughs> yeah. So I've taken a lot of parts of Marilyn Monroe because Norma Jean Baker to me is still alive in some way, mm -hmm. in some dimension. And I could go back and write about her at any time, you know. So as Marilyn Monroe, she's uh, imagined as she's a sort of uh, AI hmm. machine, you know, she's like a, a beautiful doll that's been made up of uh, very lifelike materials but she's been programmed to have Marilyn Monroe or Norma Jean Baker's actual, actual brain, you know. Wow. This kind of science fiction, but also sociological, I think, um, comment, comment, cultural comment. It sounds fascinating. Uh, great concept. Um, Joyce, Carol Oates, Babysitter is out now. Joyce, thank you so much for this uh, talk this evening. It's been really wonderful and very rewarding. Thank you. It was lovely to talk to you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Have a good weekend.